Slavery used to look like this, then it evolved into this, and today it looks like this. In fact, there are an estimated 45.8 million people living in modern slavery across 167 different countries. They fall into three general categories. Children held in the commercial sex trade, adults held in the commercial sex trade, and any other laborer made to work through force, fraud, or coercion. The trafficking victim often looks like anybody else at work, in a mine, on a farm, in a factory. Many are lured by promises of a steady job in another country, only to have their passports confiscated when they arrive. However, many slaves work in their native countries, or even the cities where they were born. According to the Global Slavery Index, these 10 countries are home to the most modern slaves. They each suffer from income inequality, discrimination in classism, and entrenched corruption. Number 10, Indonesia, produces about 35% of the world's palm oil. The many small palm plantations present an immense challenge to inspectors trying to crack down on child labor. The country's many islands are also home to tens of thousands of enslaved fishermen trafficked from Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia. Number 9 is the Democratic Republic of Congo. 20,000 of the DRC's more than 870,000 slaves live in one of the most hellish landscapes on the planet a vast ore mine in the east of the country. The terrorist group Boko Haram gets overshadowed by ISIS, although it kills more people. When it comes to enslavement, one of its tactics is to give Nigerian entrepreneurs loans and then force them to join their group if they fail to repay fast enough. Seventh is Russia. 55% of the slaves there work in construction. Foreigners are lured mainly from nearby Azerbaijan, the Stands, Ukraine, and North Korea thanks to this border on the far eastern edge of Russia. The North Korean government is the world's largest single slaveholder. Not only does it force more than one million of its people to toil in labor camps and other similarly hopeless situations, but it actually loans out some people to work in neighboring China and Russia, then pockets most of their wages. This exploitation generates about $2.3 billion each year for the Kim Jong-un regime. The fifth most enslaved country, Uzbekistan, is the world's sixth largest producer of cotton. It has benefited from forced labor, as the government puts more than one million people to work using threats of debt bondage, heavy fines, asset confiscation, and police intimidation. Slave recruiters in Bangladesh promise poor families that their boys will be given a job, only to be enslaved on a faraway island and beaten to clean fish for up to 24 hours straight. Often, these fish are exported as cat food for our pets here in the West. And sometimes, the boys meet a gruesome death when they are eaten by tigers while searching for firewood. Third is Pakistan, which has suffered through decades of conflict, terrorism, and displacement, especially along its northwestern border with Afghanistan. Its provinces have not raised the minimum age of marriage, which has allowed the widespread problem of forced and child weddings to continue. Over 250 million Chinese have migrated within the country to find better opportunities, creating the ideal conditions for human trafficking. Each year, 58 million children are left behind as their parents search for work in one of China's many booming cities. And every year, up to 70,000 children fall into forced bagging, illegal adoption, and sex slavery. And number one is India, which has by far the most victims of modern slavery. While economic growth has greatly reduced the percentage of its citizens living in poverty, the country's sheer size still results in more than 270 million Indians living on less than $2 a day. It's unsurprising then that intergenerational bonded labor, forced child labor, commercial sexual exploitation, forced bagging, forced recruitment into non-state armed groups, and forced marriage all exist in India. The good news is that the government has already created many of the laws necessary to fight the epidemic, but the challenge is effectively enforcing those laws and tracking improvements and areas of continued need. On the flip side, these are the countries rated as the 10 best at fighting modern slavery. As you can see, no country has completely eradicated the problem, and leaders on this issue, like the United States, can even contribute to it by consuming products that were, at some point in their supply chain, touched by slave labor. While it can be hopeless to be a slave, the rest of us can help by raising awareness, helping an anti-slavery group, or pressuring government officials around the world to take action. Kevin Bales, a professor of contemporary slavery and the lead author of the study on which this video is based, 
described to NPR's Fresh Air one of the many instances where he's seen slaves being freed. Can you share an example of where that's worked, where locals with the support of the organization have liberated slaves? Oh, sure. I, I, I mean, I've got lots of those, in fact. But I think the one that I, I most find re really rather thrilling myself is how in northern India, more than 10 years ago, we began to work with a local organization. Those young men who had come to freedom began to operate with our support to go into other villages where the entire village was enslaved in hereditary slavery and working in quarries. Because they were the same ethnicity, they would slip in in the evenings and they would meet with people while they were having their supper and they would say, oh, so who do you work for around here? Oh, you all work for the same person. Oh, oh, you're all working in the mines, so, but, but where's the school? Oh, there is no school. And they'd start this Socratic dialogue that would lead in time to an awakening of an understanding of an alternative. It's important to remember that when you're in hereditary slavery, you have no notion of freedom. But when the image and truth of freedom is awakened in your mind, you, you, people really do become unstoppable. And it, there would become a time when those young men would say, you know, I used to be in the same situation. I used to live in a village just like this one, but now we have a school and we even have a clinic and we, we have jobs and so forth. And then people would say, how do you get there? And then what we found there is that those villages, the women would step forward. Even though it's a very male-dominated society, the women would step forward and say, we will lead this even if it leads to our deaths because they would say, not to me, but to my women colleagues, we don't want our daughters to be raped the way we were raped by the slaveholders, by the slave masters. And they would push that along. You can learn more about this study through the link below, and you can help spread this video by hitting the like button and sharing it with your friends. Thanks for watching. Until next time, for TDC, I'm Bryce Plank.